Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to another episode of Environmental Social Justice. I'm your host, Wendy Nystrom, and today's special guest is Michelle Romero. She is the Chief Strategy Officer for Dream.org. So welcome to the show, Michelle. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for coming. I know you're crazy busy. Dream.org is a wonderful organization. I was wondering if you could tell people what it is and when it started. Yeah, Dream.org is a national nonprofit organization, and essentially we dream of a world that's beyond poverty, prisons, pollution, and polarization. Um, we got started actually many, many years ago, so in 2007, uh, when Van Jones founded the Green for All initiative, and the Green for All initiative was looking to really build an inclusive green economy. Uh, he, at the time, had been working as a criminal justice organizer and finding success in that, but realizing that if all we were doing was returning people to the same communities they came from without new pathways out of their circumstance, pathways into prosperity, that it wasn't enough. And so that way, uh, Green for All was born. Fast forward many years later, right, the heart of, you know, ending mass incarceration and putting people on a better pathway was still there. And so uh, with addition of new initiatives like Cut 50, which is now our dream.org justice program, um, we've been able to really bring those visions together to create a better future for all. And, you know, um, you mentioned, you know, so the services you guys offer, you have Dream Green, Dream Justice and Dream Tech. So you just mentioned Dream Justice. Could you real quick what Dream Green and Dream Tech are? Yeah, so Dream Green is the new name for Green for All, essentially. So we are building an inclusive green economy, and we work really at the intersection of the environment, the economy, and racial justice um, to, you know, build an economy that essentially is strong enough to lift people out of poverty. Uh, the Dream Justice Program is working to end mass incarceration and pass bipartisan policies across the country. And already we've gotten over 20,000 people out of prison. Uh, from passing the First Step Act at the federal level. And so that's been wildly successful. And our technology program really identifies that, you know, people from our communities, communities of color, need to be uploaders, not just downloaders, right? This is a way to say, look, so often when we look at the social problems, we talk about communities of color and how they're impacted, how they're harmed, how, you know, all of the negative uh, consequences are things that they are dealing with. But we don't talk enough about the talent and genius in our communities communities and how they actually are contributing and can contribute to the solutions. And so that's what that's about. I absolutely love that. And you're absolutely right. There is a wealth of knowledge out there that people just don't seem to focus on. And we need to start waking ourselves up and just focusing on that. Um, but our main topic, I really want to talk to you about um, climate issues from a mother's perspective. Could you, because mothers are often overlooked and children are often overlooked. So could you tell talk about that real quick? Of course. When I first uh, got started at Green for All, it was my first job in the environmental space. And to be honest, I wasn't sure how long I would be you know, passionate about working in these issues. From the outside looking in as a Latina, um, you know, I thought that the environmental space was really for white hippie tree huggers. Um, <laughs> so I, I followed a leader. <laughs> yeah, it's wild, really, how I'm working on these issues. Um, I followed a leader named Bien Trong who uh, was the director of the Green for All program at the time. And she was just someone I was very in awe of, a passionate social justice leader who had this vision of a clean green economy. And so I followed her to see, you know, what was that about? And luckily I found my place here. But when I first, you know, came to the organization, I said to her, you know, I'm not really sure exactly how these communities or how these issues are tied to our community. And one of the first things she did was send me to Flint, Michigan. And I had the opportunity to just sort of be in rooms with mothers who were dealing with the Flint water crisis, where they had been lead poisoned, essentially, from their water not being treated. And hearing the stories of women and how they were, one, how it was affecting their pregnancy, how it was affecting their children's, you know, just sort of cognitive and behavioral yeah. issues, right? Um, and I'll never forget this one woman had a three-year-old. And I had a three-year-old back home at the time. And she was telling me a story about how she was trying to rinse her son in the bathtub because he had had a potty accident. This is potty training age. And so while everyone knew not to drink the water, they didn't know it wasn't safe to touch it, right? Lead shouldn't have anything to do with that. And she described this experience where she'd rinsed him and within seconds he was screaming, it's burning, it's burning, you know, mommy, it's burning. Oh and she pulled him out of the water and she sees that, of course, his skin is cracking and bleeding. And so it was more than that. And, you know, back home in Sacramento, California, 
we have wildfire season every year. It's only gotten worse. Oh, it's your round. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Now it's year round. We're seeing it in the East Coast as well and everywhere, right? And it's just our kids can't even play outside. And yeah. as a mom, anyone with children, you know you would do anything to protect them, right? And so what happens when these issues are so large that they're not in our control, you know, when it's too late to do something about it? And so I feel really like when she looks at me and, and wonders, you know, what her future is going to be like, I want her to know that we've done everything that we could. Which is important. I mean, I'm, I'm not a hippie, but um, I am a scientist <laughs> and I always hated pollution. I hate the smell. I hate what's done to our atmosphere, what's done to our soils, our water and people. So people in, you know, certain neighborhoods are usually more prone to be in polluted neighborhoods and in basically the shadows of industrial complexes. And I personally hated that, not even understanding what social justice was at the time. Mm -hmm. Not even understanding what DEI was at the time. I just hated the fact that people were treated differently. And the Flint issue, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the Flint water is still contaminated. They right. still have not fixed it, which um, is extraordinarily wrong. And that should have been addressed by now. And um, I actually did not know that a toddler's skin was, was um, scaling up and bleeding from yeah. touching the water. That was news to me right now, which... Yeah is further um, infuriating me that this has not been addressed yet. So um, we do need to fix these things. We do need that so social justice issue in case people want to know. It's an environmental justice issue as well. Um, and the future we do leave children, I am hearing from a lot of 20 year olds who have said to me, why bother? We're just going to die. Mm, mm. And that is extremely upsetting. I mean, I'm not a mom, but um, I do mentor quite a few graduates. And when I hear them that depressed, we need to do better. And what your organization is doing is exactly that. You are doing better. You are helping people. You are leading the charge. Um, but, you know, speaking of leading that charge, you know, everyone follows the money. I hate to say it, but money is what kind of everyone is going to lead the way. So you're working with venture capitals and sustainable businesses. Um, could you explain how that's part of your organization as well? Yeah, I'd love to talk about the money. I mean, you, when you say climate justice is a racial justice issue, it absolutely is. And mm -hmm. that it's a health justice issue, it absolutely is. But it is also an economic justice issue. You know, for those families in Flint, Michigan, nobody can sell their houses, even if you yeah. wanted to pick up and move, right? The property values are just so much lower now. And, um, you know, when, when I think about where the money is going, there are two, pl there are two places, essentially, where money can shape the future. One in the public space, and this is this large opportunity for $369 billion in climate investment that the federal government has authorized, right, to be spent uh, in the places and through, with the people who need it the most. And the other is in the private sector. So corporate entities, venture capitalists, folks who are investing in the next technologies and solutions need to be looking everywhere, not just in their friends and family circle, right? They need to actually <laughs> be looking for, um, you know, the solutions that we need. And so I have to tell you this story. Um, we, I've been working with these incredible uh, African-American CEOs of all of these different green technology companies. And one oh, of them... Yeah. One of them is working on uh, solar panels and they have a solar technology that is very efficient. So he actually back in high school, I'll tell you how he got this story and why. And this is just, I feel like illuminates why we need everyone at the table, why lived experience matters. He was in high school taking his yearbook photo and his yearbook photo came back to him. And as an African-American man, right, he got this photo that was very dark, didn't show his features. Uh, it was a terrible picture. And he said, I'm not going to let that in the yearbook. I'm going to take my own picture and I'll, <laughs> I'll submit it myself. So he goes home and he gets his uncle to help him uh, set up lighting and camera at home. And they retake his photo. Now, now his photo shows the undertones of his skin and his features. You can actually see his face. He submits that one to the yearbook. But he asks his uncle, how is it possible that at school we had all this professional setup, but the photo is so different, oh, right? Yeah. And so in that moment, his uncle explained how you can split UV light to pull in different sorts of um, undertones and, and shading and that sort of thing. And so he took that lesson forward. Fast forward, he ended up working at solar companies, installing solar, uh, and realized that the solar panels we have are really not that efficient. At the time, they were capturing maybe 17% of the yeah. sun's energy. Um, and so he decided there had to be a better way. And he went to work on figuring out how do we maximize 
solar energy. And he created a solar panel technology that is now, I think, 46% efficient or more. I, I can't keep up with how, how much they continue to improve it, but it was oh, yeah. more than double the efficiency of what was the standard on the market. Not only that, it actually was cheaper to produce. He was manufacturing, he's, he is manufacturing um, and creating the jobs here in the United States. And so these are the kinds of sort of unsung heroes, untold stories that need to be more visible. And we need venture capital. We need the federal government when they're giving out these big loans and chances, right? Yes. To take a chance on people who really are bringing forth incredible solutions. Oh, I'm so glad you brought up venture capitalism because um, I do a wide myriad of things. <laughs> and one of those is I do focus on VC. And um, there was a woman I interviewed named Tracy Gray. She runs the 22 Fund. And I had met her years ago and she gave a speech about venture capitalists and how women get about 5% or less of all VC money. People of color, 2% or less, more like one. I mean, right. it's really next to nothing. And when we talk about solar panels and the gentleman who invented them basically out of curiosity. Let me talk about this. Oh, I, I have a, a quandary. I'm going to fix it. Mm -hmm. But then the VCs are often giving money to certain people who let's say live in Bermuda or the Bahamas, sorry, the Bahamas and decide to have a fake company that they just spent on real estate and fun and parties and, and airfare. Why is that being funded and not the brilliant innovative ideas for renewable energy. Right. And it just goes back to, we need to look at everybody. Everybody needs to be invited to the table because there is a knowledge base there that is exceptional that we need to focus on. And yeah. so many ideas. I mean, I've talked to a lot of people who are based out of Africa and they have phenomenal ideas, not just in renewable energy, but education. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, organizations like yours, dream.org, Getting these people seen, mm -hmm. that's the most important is getting people seen and yeah. the opportunity and seeing and just bringing them to the table and letting them have the opportunity to talk is amazing. I absolutely yeah. love, I love that fact. And um, part of it, um, going to our next step, the intersect, I'm sorry, the creating an inclusive green economy. So that's now taking that VC, the innovation and creating the inclusive green economy. How is dream.org working in that? Right. Yeah. Well, so I wanted to share about our dream launch pad. Actually, we have a climate oh, tech, yeah. a dream climate tech launch pad. And we're going to be taking this summer uh, eight to 10 uh, black and Latinx uh, founders of climate tech companies. And we're going to be providing them investor readiness training because I think this is just a world, you know, the VC world is a world in which uh, many folks from our community just don't have access, don't know how it works. You may not have grown up around rich folks and know how to ask money, ask for money or know, uh, you know, when your company is sort of ready for that sort of investment and to go after the different rounds. And so we're going to be providing that. We're going to be connecting people with mentors. Um, folks can learn more about that at dream.org. And then we are going to be having a demo day at Verge. Um, at Green Business Verge event in October, which is very exciting. That'll be in the Bay Area. And we're going to have them showcase their solutions. And so if you're interested in where do I find these folks, right? Yeah. Come to Verge. Uh, it's a great space. And we're going to be featuring several Black and Latinx uh, founders with great solutions. And so I'll, I'll share that. Um, but, you know, this is when I think about how to build an inclusive green economy, I think about what moment we're in. Yeah. And we are in this unprecedented historic time. And I don't just mean because we have however many years left and the clock is ticking, right? And we need to hurry up and figure this out. I mean, because our government this past year authorized $369 billion as part of the Inflation Reduction Act just for climate investment. This is an opportunity to infuse cash in the people and places that need it the most. Yes, sir. Um, when I think about innovation, I think about how do we get those dollars to small businesses, to founders, right, who can work on their solutions. Um, but we've got to do it differently. We have to do it differently. So we need to build this pipeline of uh, founders of color with solutions that are ready for scale, right, and get them to a place of readiness. Right now, the federal government, when the Department of Energy is giving out loans, there are these massive loans. Um, you know, it, it costs money for the federal government to give out money, <laughs> just the administrative <laughs> cost. So they want to give it out in large chunks. Um, what happens then, though, is that you really lock out competition for uh, newer, 
smaller businesses and founders and ideas. So we need a program that can solve that. We need some more help really at that early stage for folks so that we it's not just the monopolies, right? It's not just oh, absolutely. the, the yeah. same large companies. Um, no. The, the other opportunity, of course, is how do we get this money to communities? Yeah. To transform communities. So, so many of our climate solutions, whether that's solar, whether it's energy efficiency in homes, whether it's providing electric vehicle infrastructure in neighborhoods that you would normally see it, um, these are solutions that can reduce the cost of living and yeah. improve quality of life. And so what would it look like to have community wide solutions, you know, things like affordable housing uh, centered near transit oriented development with sidewalks and bike pathways, right? Oh, and yeah. again, in under invested in communities. And so we're working on that. We're working on helping uh, draw down those funds and get them to the places that need it. And we do that through two ways. Um, one, working with the regulators, so with government themselves, right, to help design the criteria for who is competitive for these funds, uh, make sure they're considering different equity-based criteria. And then uh, second, with communities and helping them to develop a pipeline of shovel-worthy and shovel-ready projects uh, so that they can be ready to compete as well. I, and I love the idea. I had a friend probably five or six years ago um, who was trying to build a village and it was going to be multi-generational so when people have to go to work the um, retirees could watch the children it keeps them young it gets the children to in interact with other generations everything was going to be renewable energy off the grid well not completely off the grid but mostly renewable energy bike paths and parks and recreation mm -hmm. and you know proper grocery stores with healthy food and there was just no funding um she she made a, a strong swing at it she's a brilliant woman and this was before the the act was passed and you know hopefully something like that can get restarted because we do need affordable housing especially in california it's gotten a little bit ridiculous right and we need you know when you say shovel ready we need to make sure that land's not contaminated because um most of our soil is and usually in places that we're going to build affordable housing is going to be cheaper land which unfortunately means brownfield mm. and we need to make sure that land is clean so people can you know live there, work there, play there and not worry. So um, very important to do. And um, when you talked about the funding, <laughs> you were absolutely right. When that act was passed, many of the very large engineering firms got their entire funding departments online because they wanted those billions of dollars. And these are companies that are already worth hundreds of millions or a billion dollars. Right. We need to really have a program established where smaller businesses and startups get that much needed funding, because I think that'll be revolutionary. So many of these companies do the same thing the same way time over time again. We need some some thought there. We need we need new ideas to be cultivated and hashed out and, and formed so we can have the change that we need. As you said, we're, we're getting close. We, we need it done. <laughs> We really do. And it's look, it's uh, it benefits the U.S. if it can figure it out. We like to yeah. think of ourselves in this country as the most innovative, you know, geniuses in the world like that. We have that that sort of mentality. And it's if we don't actually have opportunities and pathways, if we don't make the resources we have available available to everyone, then we're we're fighting this climate change issue with one hand behind our back. You know, we need to really unleash the full suite of American ingenuity on the problem. Um, the other thing I would say, you know, in the VC space, it's really interesting because you have basically a growing um, sector of uh, diverse funds, funds that are looking at diverse owned uh, founders, essentially. So you've got black VC funds and things like that that are really focused on the founders, but yep. they're not always focused on climate issues. So they're sort of agnostic to the to the. Um, industries, if you will, and focus more on founders. And then you've got all the climate tech founders focused on climate tech as an industry and not at all focused on the founders. So we can just get those two <laughs> working to talk. together. We get them talking, right? Then we might actually be able to uh, solve not just climate change, but the economic justice issue, because these okay. are the folks, when you think about, you know, when I grew up in the 90s and 2000s, right? Uh, this is the dot-com boom. Everyone made their money off computers. And when we think ahead 30, 40, 50 years from now, everyone's going to say they made their money in climate tech solutions. They made their money in the green economy. And Hopefully. so, this is, yeah, so it really is, we can't overlook the environmental, or I mean, the economic piece of this. Oh, absolutely. And there's so many ideas out there. I mean, 
Um, there are tons of inventors that are coming up with really cool ideas. They just need the platform to be heard. They need right. to be able to um, pitch their ideas and have someone look deep into their technology. Like, you know, it's not a bad idea. Let's see if we can scale this one up because everything's a crazy idea until you until it works. Mm -hmm. And then next thing you know, you have the great inventor inventor of you know 21st century. <laughs> so, I, I love what you guys are doing. Um, before I let you go though, could you tell people one where are you where they can find you? Yep. where maybe inventors could find the VC person or someone to get in touch with if they want to pitch an idea. And if you guys are doing an events or if you want volunteers or how people can get involved. Yeah, well, look, you can follow us. Um, well, I'm on Instagram at Michelle Dreams 2. Uh, and the Dream Core is also on Instagram. But our website is dream.org. And I would say connect with us. You can find my email on the website, uh, Michelle at dream.org. Uh, and I'm happy to connect you with some of these incredible innovators. <clears throat> but we also have this amazing community newsletter. So for communities who are trying to figure out how to draw down some of these funds, we produce a monthly newsletter. And if they text DREAM, text the word DREAM to 97483, uh, we can get you signed up for that so that you get all the information and resources about what's available and how to tap into those dollars. I absolutely love that. You make it so simple. Sign up for the text, get the information. That's wonderful. Well, Michelle, thank you so much for your time today. And I absolutely love what dream.org is doing. You guys, I mean, you're kind of an all encompassing solution for every problem out there. So that is very important. You didn't focus on one thing. You didn't silo yourself. You're kind of attacking everything at once and trying to make the world a better place. So that takes effort. So thank you for all that. Connected. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Wendy. It is all connected. Everything's a chain reaction. I keep telling people that. <laughs> so thank you again, Michelle. I'm Wendy Nystrom, your host with Environmental Social Justice with special guest Michelle Romero with Dream.org. You guys take care. Thank you.